Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. And I am glad that you've chosen to spend your Mother's Day weekend in part with us here at Burnside. All you mothers out there, if you have not filled out a little pink piece of paper uh, for our drawing, uh, please do so. Uh, I'm not going to look down on you. You can get up right now, go back to the back, fill out your... If you've already filled one out, you can't fill out another one, sorry. But uh, this is an opportunity. We want to make sure that uh, uh, we have an opportunity to recognize and value our mothers and uh, what a blessing they are to us. And, and I'm biased, I recognize, but my mom was pretty great. And uh, I hope she's having a great day. Uh, and then my dad is spoiling her today. And we want to hopefully spoil you this morning as well, moms. Thank you for all your work and your dedication and your service. And today is kind of one of those weird days where we're kind of in between. And what I mean by that is if you have been following along, man, we've been in the book of John for like forever, and we went verse by verse and we studied, and, and uh, hopefully you were blessed by that. And uh, we're getting ready to enter into the book of Acts, and that's going to be a verse by verse study as well, and it's going to be pretty lengthy too. And I thought, you know what, let's just take a minute, let's breathe, and uh, let's pause, and let's do something maybe that's a little bit um, not so intense and study. And uh, so we're going to spend the month of May talking about a topic that I think is needed, uh, talking about a topic that I think um, needs to be talked about, and that is the topic of service. Uh, the title of this series is based upon a Charles Swindoll book that I read years ago when I did uh, my uh, uh, undergrad studies at Central uh, called Improving Your Serve. And uh, now look, I'm not a tennis player. Uh, but the times that I have played tennis, I can just tell you and take my word for it, my serve is terrible, okay? It was awful. Now, let's just imagine for a moment, if you would, with me, that let's say that I decided that, you know what, next Sunday I decide, you know what, I'm going to quit the ministry and I'm going to devote my life to a, being a full-time professional tennis player. I'm going to do the training that's needed. I'm going to buy the equipment that's necessary. I'm going to get the best coach that money can buy. And let's say just for a moment that I seek and, and, and start my endeavor to become the greatest tennis player ever. But I have a conversation with my coach before we ever begin training. And I say, you know what? I want to be the best tennis player in the world. I want to be number one. But I'm not good at serving. Can we just let the other guy serve the whole time? How well do you think that's going to go over for me as a professional tennis player? Not very well. Well, let's take the physical illustration and apply it to the spiritual Christian life. Listen to me. It's a very bold statement, but it's also a very true statement. You cannot be a Christian without serving. Let me say that again because it's a pretty weighty comment. You cannot be a Christian without serving. Where do you get that from, Mark? Well, finish this verse. You know it. Faith without works is dead. You have to understand that Jesus has called you to pick up your cross daily and follow Him. And what did Jesus Himself do? Was he all about himself and, hey, you guys uh, wash my feet? Jesus was all about serving others. He said himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and not serve. Here's some verses that this entire series is birthed from. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you should be serving. And so for the next uh, three weeks, uh, we're going to be studying this idea of serving. And the title of this morning's sermon is specifically this, what Jesus has to say about serving. 
So in the series, there's three sermons. Today is what Jesus says about serving. Next week is what Jesus shows about serving. And then the final sermon in the series will be uh, what Jesus supplies to us about serving. Side note, I need to correct that. Next week, Matt Churchill is going to be preaching. Uh, He's going to be presenting the the, the church camp and helping me out greatly. Because you know why? Drum roll, please. This Friday is graduation. And I can't wait. So, yeah. So, thank you. And uh, so Matt's doing me a huge favor because the weekend is chocked full with responsibilities and he's going to be presenting the camp and preaching and we're thrilled to death to hear about that. So next week is Matt. The next week after that, we'll continue the sermon series about serving. And uh, this is what you need to understand. If Jesus himself said the Son of Man comes to not be served but to serve, then it should not be surprising that Jesus himself has a lot to say about serving and about serving one another's. Here's just two verses that I found that Jesus talked about when it came to service. Luke 22, 26. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. In Mark chapter 10, verse 44, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. Man, this was a principle that his disciples forgot repeatedly throughout his ministry. They felt like a distinguishing mark of a great disciple was one who had many people serving them. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you guys have it backwards. In my kingdom, in my uh, reign, it's the people who are being, uh, it's the people who are doing the serving that are considered the greatest. It's a discipline, and it takes practice. And everyone here could improve in the discipline of serving the master. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today, is the discipline of serving the master. And as we jump now into Luke chapter 7, verses 7 through 10, we're going to read these verses, and then we're going to come back and we're going to unpack them. So if you have your Bibles, please open them up to Luke chapter 17. Uh, Just these these four verses that we're going to read, starting in verse 7. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come in immediately and sit down and eat. But won't he say to him, prepare something for me to eat first, properly clothe yourself, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, whenever you do all the things which are commanded of you, simply say we are We're unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Man, these are some really pointed words of Jesus, but it's some good stuff for us to have in our forefront of our minds as we think about this topic of service. And there's three statements that I want to kind of uh, relate to you that we get from Jesus in these verses. And here's the first. Uh, We must not expect God to serve us simply because we have served him. We must not expect God to serve us simply because we have served Him. Look at verse 7. Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately in and, and sit down and eat? The context is very clear. Jesus is giving an illustration. He, it's a farming illustration. But let me put it in maybe um, a context of 2022 that might help you understand it a little better. Let's say, just for instance, that you have a leaky faucet uh, or maybe a leaky tub would be better in your upstairs bathroom of your home. And it's causing such a leak that the leak is dripping through uh, the ceiling of the downstairs living room. And it's creating a mess. And so you, if you're like me, you don't have the skills to fix it your own. So you call a plumber. And you call the plumber and you hire them and you get them to come out. And they have spent all day tearing apart the drywall of the ceiling, getting at the pipe, fixing the leaky pipe. Maybe it's a stool that's leaking, replacing the stool, doing all of this. The illustration would be like, how many of you, when you hired the plumber to come into your home, after he's worked all day, he's dirty, he's filthy, would be like, oh, come downstairs and sit in my Lazy Boy and watch television while I get you something to eat. 
None of us would do that. Why? Because we've hired the plumber to do the job which he was supposed to do for us in the first place. And that's the illustration that Jesus is giving here when he's talking about the hired hand working on the farm. He's putting it into the context of feeding him and, and getting him something to drink and, and waiting on him. And, and, and the whole point is that you would, none of us would do that. And the fact of the matter is, is that we are the hired servant. And rather than focusing on what I want and what I need, we have to continually remain focused on what it is the master needs and what the master wants. Look, I know some of you have been serving Christ longer than I've been alive. And I'm so thankful for the faithfulness of so many here at Burnside. You guys, uh, man, we've got Sunday school teachers been teaching longer than I've been alive. We've got faithful workers who are giving up their Mother's Day to be serving in junior church and in the nursery. I love that about this church. This church, as a body in whole, is one who's dedicated to service. But here's the, the reason for the sermon series. Here's the reason for the sermon today. To simply encourage you to not quit. To continue to serve Him in all areas. And what's the old saying? Help me figure this one out. Uh, many hands make light work. All right? There's work that needs to be done here at Burnside. And instead of relying on the faithful 20% of our body who's going to do 80% of the work, it would be so much more advantageous for God's kingdom if we would spread that burden out and everybody would step in and serve. So here's the word of encouragement for you. As you serve, focus on the master first. Never me first. Always what is God doing first? Not what I want what is it that God wants? What is it that He needs? We must not expect God to serve us before we've served Him. Focus on God, His desires, His wills, making His joy complete. I think what happens here when we talk about serving is that we have some um, unrealistic expectations when it comes to serving God. And, and many of us might be like, you know what, God, I've done a lot for you. I have followed you. I have served you. But I'm expecting you to do some things for me now, God. Um, never forget, we are the servant. He is the master. And what I want you to be aware of right now is maybe thinking about some of the expectations that we place upon God as we serve him. Because we may not even verbalize, we may not even uh, speak these expectations out loud, but I think we all have them from time to time. We expect God is going to protect my family. God, I'm faithfully serving you. I've been teaching Sunday school. Uh, I've been working uh, buildings and grounds behind the scene. Nobody knows, but man, I've been working hard. I sacrifice my time, even giving my money to you, so these things can happen for your kingdom. God, I expect you to protect my family. Not to let any accidents or tragedies happen to me or my family. I think another expectation that we have of God is that he would financially provide for us. You know, I'll serve you only as long as you provide financially and bless me and my family. I need a job, Lord, but it needs to pay more than the job I last had. I'm not going backwards in any way. I think another unexpected unspoken expectation we have for God is health and healing. And listen, God does heal. But watch out when this becomes your expectation. And it's right to pray that God would heal you from whatever ailment you have. But watch out that you don't demand it as part of your payment for faithful servant service to Him. This is a good phrase to make note of. I've said it in the past. Just because God is able doesn't mean that God is obligated. That's a good reminder. Just because God is able doesn't mean that God is obligated. And it's never wrong to ask God to heal you, but don't demand God do these things for you as though it were owed to you. What I'm doing simply here this morning is trying to make you aware that there's a math equation that we as Christians sometimes play out in our heads. That if I do X, then God's going to do Y. And this is somehow a contract relationship with the Lord that as long as, as I'm doing my part, then God will do His part. 
But I'm only going to do my part as long as God does his part. And as soon as he doesn't meet my expectations in the way that I want them to be met, I'm out. Jesus simply says, don't expect God to serve us just because we have served him. Here's the second phrase that Jesus brings to our attention that he has to say about serving. He says, we must not expect immediate reward for serving him. Notice in verses 7 and 8, which of you having a slave plowing and tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come in immediately and sit down and eat. But will he not say to him instead, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and while I drink and afterward you may eat and drink. You see, the servant didn't come barging through the door and the master had the table of blessing set before him. Because it was his work. It was his responsibility. The servant was doing his job. You don't necessarily get immediate reward for doing your job. And that leads me to say this, jot this down. Don't serve with the wrong motives. You know what I mean? You ever served and you served with the wrong motives and then you were left disappointed because you're uh, motives were faulty and it didn't match up to what the reason was that you were serving in the first place. We're going to learn more about this in uh, three weeks. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, um, you know what 1 Corinthians 13 is known as? It's known as the love chapter. And if you flip the page back and you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, do you know what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about? It's about the body of Christ, that there are many parts, but one body. And Paul is addressing spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me put it, the whole thing into context for you. The Corinthians were having a hard time getting along. Some thought that they were better than others because of the spiritual giftedness that they possessed through the Holy Spirit. And so what was happening was they were all kind of looking out for themselves. They had forgotten the commandment. They had forgotten the mandate that, that God said to love one another. And so they were looking at themselves and they thought that they themselves were superior on an individual level because after all, I have this spiritual gifting and that's way better than your spiritual gifting. I can do miracles. What can you do? Oh, that's nice. You can't do miracles? Well, I'm better than you are. Serve me. That's the mentality that was happening in 1 Corinthians, in the Corinthian church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 27, Paul is addressing it. And he's saying, look, you guys, you are Christ's body, and individually you are members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Not all are apostles, are they? are they? Not everyone's a prophet, are they? Not everyone's a teacher or a worker of miracles, are they? All don't have gifts of healing, do they? Not everybody speaks with the gift of tongues, do they? Not everybody's an interpreter, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. Hey, what do you think the more excellent way that Paul is going to show them how to serve one another is? Ding, 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 ding! love. And so as you flip the page to 1 Corinthians 13, 1, now comes the familiar verses that Paul is encouraging the Corinthian church. Look, you think you're so big? You think you're so high and mighty? You can have all the things in the world, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. And Paul is pointing out that the proper motivation to serve one another needs to be love. That's the reason that you do what you do. So what's the right motive for serving? It's love. Think about that and how it relates to your area of service. Sunday school teachers, you teach because you love. You teach the students that are in your class, whether they are kids or whether they are, are adults, because you love them and you want to help explain the scriptures better to them. That's your motivation for love. If that's your motivation for serving you're going to find that it's a little easier to serve. You're going to find that it's not such a, a, a dredge to be like, oh, here we go again, got to prepare the lesson. If your motivation is love, 
That's what's going to be make it a little bit easier to serve those around you. For those who clean the church building, man, you clean the church building, you clean the toilets and the bathrooms and take out the trash because you love the people in this church and you want them to be able to come into a place that's comfortable and experience clean bathrooms and trash cans that are emptied. When you serve in the praise band, you're not doing it for your own self-glorification. You want to lead the people, God's people, in worship songs for Him. And you love God, and you love the people, and that's why you do what you do. Now listen, if you can't muster enough love for one another to serve them, well, that's sad. But if you can't muster enough love to serve the people around you, then muster enough love for God that you would do whatever it is that He would ask you to do. Get the right motive. And you'll find serving is a little bit easier. Sometimes people serve with the wrong motives, and because of that, they end up quitting serving. It's because they had the wrong motives for service in the first place. So let's talk a little bit about why people quit serving. Uh, I, I just came up with three reasons. There's probably a, a myriad of other reasons out there, but uh, one of the reasons that people quit serving is because I don't feel appreciated. Nobody thanked me. Nobody even noticed. Nobody said, hey, I really appreciate what it is you do. I, I hope that we're an, an appreciative church. But if you're serving just simply to get the slap on the back and the attaboy, then you're serving with the wrong motives, and Jesus touches on that even still. He says, your father who sees what you are doing, when nobody else sees it, he's going to reward you. He's going to tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't matter if in the moment of your service, anybody notices. The appreciation for service comes from God himself. And when we're serving, we're serving him. And uh, another thing you need to understand is that it's not over yet. Uh, the story hasn't concluded and so don't be impatient and don't quit serving just because you don't feel appreciated. Here's another reason that sometimes people quit serving. Well, I didn't get the results that I wanted. I poured forth my greatest effort. I worked so hard and well, I just didn't get the result that I was expecting. I thought more people would show up to the activity. I thought more lives would be impacted. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it makes it clear that the results are dependent upon God. It says, one plants, another waters, but God gives the growth. And you can't control the outcome. You can only control the effort. And so maybe you haven't seen the fruit yet that you wanted to see, but be patient because God's on that. And the final reason that people sometimes quit serving is, well, I didn't get the feelings that I wanted. I wanted to feel happy and fulfilled. Well, here's something maybe that you might not be aware of. Ministry is hard work. And when you have an area of service that, is, that you're committed to, that is your ministry. And you need to understand that ministry is hard work. The word toil comes to mind. The word messy comes to mind. I mean, certainly there are times where ministry is pure joy. But there are times where it's just pure work, too. And here's the pattern of how ministry goes in case you weren't aware. The model was true for me in youth ministry and it's proven to be true for me in preaching ministry. And I have an inkling of suspicion that this is true for you in your ministry as well. It goes something like this. You work hard, you put in the effort, you bear some fruit. There's some results that happen. God's blessing it. It's growing. It's multiplying. It's, there's excitement surrounding it. But then comes a season of pruning. You know what pruning is, don't you? It's where God cuts away the dead so that more fruit can be produced. And it's a painful process. God is cutting away the thing that is not growing, the thing that is not advancing, the thing that is not thriving in order that more fruit might be seen. So you bear fruit, you get pruned, and then you bear more fruit. And if you don't quit, well, then you get pruned again. 
and then you bear more fruit. But here's the thing. Some people quit serving because of the pruning when it happens and they're not hanging around long enough to see the more fruit that's being uh, uh, it produced in life. I don't know if you remember this or not. Um, I'll be honest with you, I didn't remember this. But um, I was reminded of it this last week. When I first took over the preaching pulpit here at Burnside Christian Church, I made a promise to you. Anybody remember the promise that I made? The promise that I made was this, that I'm not going to quit or leave just because I got my feelings hurt or because I didn't get my way. You remember that promise? And uh, 15 years later of preaching, still here doing it. Look, serving isn't always easy. It's not always fun. But if you're committed to it, you will see the fruit that is there. And I believe firmly we're in a season of pruning here at Burnside Christian Church. And I know it's painful, and I know it's not fun. But hang on, hang in there, keep serving. Because I believe fruit is right around the corner. And I believe that. It's the pattern of ministry. Keep serving Jesus. It's the distinguishing character uh, quality of a follower of Jesus Christ, and that's what we're after. Don't expect immediate reward for your service, however, but a day is coming when you will be rewarded and what you have done in secret will be made public. And that is the day of judgment. That's the day when God will reward every, every person, both good and bad, for the deeds that they have done. And that's what we serve. That's why we serve. God knows. He knows how you're serving Him. Well, here's the third and final thing that Jesus says concerning service from our text this morning. And it's really uh, not all that surprising, but it is a little bit difficult for us to fully grasp. Here it is. We must see service as our obligation to Jesus Christ. What? It's my job? That kind of takes the joy out of serving if it's something that I'm supposed to do. Well, look at verse 10, because verse 10 can't be any more clear, I don't think. Jesus says, so you too, when you do all the things which are commanded of you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. I want, to, I want you to pay attention to the last verse, uh, the last sentence, rather, of verse 10. We have only done that which we ought to have done. What Jesus is saying is this, that when you serve, in effect, you're doing your job as a follower of Jesus Christ. And some of you do so much for the Lord. And I appreciate those of you who are so willing to step into jobs that are messy, that are hard, that are difficult. But here's the hard words of, Je hard words, harsh words of Jesus Christ. You're doing your job. And here's the reality that each of us must face. You're commanded to serve. It's command. And if I could just be the messenger on behalf of Jesus Christ this morning, He commands you to serve. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to think, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll consider it. This is the 24-7, 365 obligation of a follower of Jesus Christ. Serve. To roll up your sleeves, jump in with both feet, and do what needs to be done. Well, Mark, I don't know, you're making me kind of uncomfortable. I don't think I want to come to this church anymore. Listen to me. We're making disciples. We're making committed followers of Jesus Christ. And Jesus doesn't need, His kingdom doesn't need any more pew nodders. He doesn't need a bunch of people coming in here and agreeing with what's been said and not doing the work that needs to be done. And if you want to sit in a church that will let you come to church and put a check mark next to your name for showing up, well, listen, I'm sorry to see you go, but Burnside Christian Church is not for you. He needs disciples. He needs people who are committed to working for the kingdom. And a group of disciples who are going to change the world. Think about that just for a minute. You remember when we were in John's Gospel, specifically in John chapter 21, and Jesus appears to his disciples, and where are they? They're in an upper room behind a locked door. And Jesus is like, what are you knuckleheads doing? This is not what I've called you to do. 
And I think many churches in America have become stagnant with their service. We've become consumeristic with our church services. What can you provide for me is the mentality of many Christians today. When the truth is, Jesus hasn't called us to congregate and sit on our hands. He's called us to go make disciples of the world. And that's what we want to be about as good faithful stewards of what God has entrusted to us here at Burnside Christian Church. The leadership here, the staff here, has an envision for what it looks like to be a part of Burnside Christian Church. We're going to get to it several weeks down the road. Uh, but we have a vision for every member to be serving at Burnside Christian Church. We believe wholeheartedly God has gifted each person with a unique set of gifts. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 talks about. Various body members, but all one body. And we believe wholeheartedly that God has gifted you and blessed you with things that only you can do. The things that only you can provide Burnside with. Where if you weren't doing what you're supposed to be doing, that would not happen. It wouldn't get done. Because nobody else can fulfill what it is you are supposed to do. More on that to come. But we're setting some groundwork here. The expectation of Jesus Christ is that you serve. It's assumed. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to serve. A Christian who is not serving is a contradiction of terms. And I'm sorry if this is news to you that somehow you were not aware of it when you signed up to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Because serving is exactly what you and I have been called to do. Next week, what I love about Jesus, sorry, two weeks, what I love about Jesus that He's going to show to us is that He doesn't just talk to us and kind of point the finger and be like, you guys need to serve. He's going to demonstrate it through His own life. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. I don't ever want to be guilty or accused of being a preacher who's like, yeah, you guys need to work harder at serving. You guys need to sign up for a church cleaning team. Did you know I'm on a church cleaning team? Did you know that I'm on a snow scooping team? Because I believe that much that it's not just uh, leaders are supposed to serve by example. And I believe that your elders are serving by example. And, uh, and, and I so appreciate the guys that I get to work with week in and week out. But here's the thing. This week, what has Jesus said about service? It's your obligation. It's your responsibility. It's your joy to serve. Next week, two weeks, we're going to look at Jesus showing us how to serve. The final week is, he doesn't expect you to do it on your own. He's supplied you, he has gifted you with some resources available to you that will help you serve. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a time decision, a song of decision here this morning. So will you stand up with me this morning? <clears throat> and let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our song of decision.